Hi, I'm Kevin McAdams. I've been a broadcaster, producer, a soldier, a retail manager, and a teacher. And now I'm a podcaster. You know, I've wanted to do a podcast for years, but I could never decide what it should be about. Should it be news, sports, politics, my favorite sci-fi? Then it hit me. I know a lot of people who do a lot of interesting things and have a lot of cool stories to tell. And I thought, let's tell those stories. So it doesn't have to be the same thing every week. It can be what I say it is. Hi, and welcome to Episode 7, Steve Elkins, as seen on a TV in Germany. So far in this podcast, I've talked to mostly friends and colleagues I started working with in the, quote, old days, circa 2004 to 2007-ish. In this episode, I go all the way back to the really old days and talk to a guy I worked side-by-side with at my hometown radio station, KAND, in Corsicana, Texas, circa 1985. Steve Elkins is an actor, a voiceover artist, a graphic artist, a costume designer, and he was a broadcaster for 13 years. He's been through the process of personal and professional reinvention several times, and he's got a lot to say about the process. He's a very brave man, and he's got a lot to say about handling the challenges of jumping back into his acting career in middle age, which could apply to anyone making a big midlife change. He's appeared in a number of projects over the last several years, some of which are mentioned in our conversation, so you can go check it out afterwards. It'll be easy to find Steve after we're done. He's also one of three people I know personally with credits on IMDb, and the only person I know who's been seen on a TV screen in Germany. Talk a little bit about your, your history in radio. What did, uh, what did it mean to you? What first got you into it? Well, what got me into it, <clears throat> funny, funny enough, uh, there was this um, program that they had through the um, high school. I, I think it was done through a local Boy Scouts thing, some sort of an extension thing through the local Boy Scouts or something. It was called the the Radio Explorers. Mm. You know, it sounded uh, much, much more exciting than it actually (laughs) was, you know. Uh, I had, I had, I'd taken some kind of questionnaire and that I was, um, and and, and they assess your interest, you know, what, what your likes what your likes are, you know, what sort of things interest you, what sort of things make you tick. And uh, evidently performance, um, media, things like radio, television, things like that uh, evidently came up strong on mine. So the next thing I know, I'm, I'm re I'm getting this um, information for the radio explorers program, which was hosted uh, through the local radio station, you know, K A N D. Um, and I had <laughs> agreed, I, I had agreed to go to one of the first meetings that they were, they were having. Actually, this was something that had been going, that had gone on for several years. And, um, I was, <laughs> I was going to go, uh, that night. It was on a Tuesday night. I remember because I was sitting at home watching happy days and I, I i get this call yeah i remember that it came on tuesday nights and i get this phone call the, the, the episode of happy days had come on then I, the phone rings and I, I run and answer the phone and it's a friend of mine from school saying hey elkins where are you man i'm like um I, i'm home well I'm, I'm home obviously you know because this day before cell the days before cell phones right I'm, I'm, I'm home, man. What, wow. What's up? And I was surprised this particular guy was calling me because he never called me at home for anything. I just knew him from school. And he said, yeah, we're, we're at the radio station, man. The, the, the radio explorers meetings tonight. I was like, Oh, Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I turn off the TV, get my shoes on. And I, of course I didn't drive at that time. And, and I got my mom, uh, to give me a ride to the radio station. I said, yeah, there's this thing at the radio station I'm supposed to do. And she, and so, you know, she, she took me and I said, I'll call you when I'm, when I'm done. And I got there and, and, uh, there was just a, a small a group of high school kids that were there. And then some people from the previous radio explorers group, uh, were there as well to sort of mentor us. 
And long story short, I, I, I did this Radio Explorers thing for however many months we did it. And then we um, got to the last session and the program director, who was one of the, the sponsors, as well as one of the, um, the, the sales guys who also sponsored this thing, called me into the production room. I'm thinking, oh boy, they're, they're, they're going to tell me don't come back. You know, I, I guess, you know, I, I guess maybe I goofed around too much. I don't know. And anyway, they, they asked me, we may be filling a position this summer. Would you be interested? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then I didn't hear from them for a couple of more months. And then finally my dad encouraged me to just well, go down to the station and ask them about it or call them or something. So, uh, I went by there one day, had my dad take me by, and I went in real quick. And it was like they had forgotten they had asked me about that, but they I think they suddenly remembered. And again, long story short, they said, yeah, we could use you this summer. And so in the summer of 1982, I started working Saturday nights and Sunday afternoons at KAND, spinning reel-to-reel -reel tapes. <laughs> so did well, first off, I want to thank you for one thing. That is, oh, okay. you're welcome. It's taken me thirty years to get the K A N D jingle out of out of my brain. Thank you for oh, putting it oh, back yeah. there. That, oh, that, okay, well, really, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm, yeah. But uh, the the, the program probably. program director who hired you was that Dick Aldama? That would be Dick Aldama. Yes, guys, because he hired me too. I showed up yeah. there one day, and I just uh, I said walked in and they're like, what do you want? I'm, or can I help you? And I'm says, I just want to see what a radio station looks like. Mm -hmm. And he liked my voice. So he takes me back to the production room and says, he, Hey, here, read, read, read this. So I don't even know what's going on. He turns on the mic and I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Probably, probably like a hands or a Withrow furniture commercial or something. Cause they were all over right. the place back then. And it's like, okay, well, you ever think about working here? I'm like, I don't know. He says, well, I may call you sometime. And six months later, he wakes me up at like seven in the morning on a Saturday. <laughs> and I remember I just, I just come from, it was my junior year. I went on a school trip to Germany and Austria and had just gotten back the day before. <laughs> and I'm like, so, Hey, you want to, you want to work weekend? I'm like, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Come on down at nine. Uh, uh, okay. And, you know, next thing you know, I'm doing the, the Sunday morning, uh, the Sunday morning religious shows. Yeah. Yeah. I talked about that with an earlier guest. That's how a lot, a lot of us got in you, you just go in at 6 a.m. on Sunday and play every denomination all morning, one tape after <laughs> another. But you, you went on to some other, some other radio experience, didn't you? Or was no, that your only really. station? Uh, the extent of my radio experience was right there in Corsicana, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, I, I started out on the AM and of course I just rode the board on the FM, but then when they expanded the programming on the FM, kind of changed the format. We all remember that. Mm -hmm. um, um, I went over to the FM almost exclusively and uh, did that uh, for a number of years. And, and then I just sort of did, um, summer and vacation fill-in work for about 13 years off and on. Well, that's it was awesome. my college job. So then you went on to become an actor and I know I, and next week I'll be talking with my, uh, my second cousin, John McAdams, who I, I know, you know, very well. I uh, runs the Kearns library right now, but you two were involved yeah. pretty heavily in the community theater there in town. Yes, I was. Yeah, talk a little fact, bit about, go ahead. Well, well, I was going to say it was my association with the radio station that really got me into the acting. Now, acting, <clears throat> it, it was something I, deep down, I always, always wanted to do, even from the time I was a kid. In fact, you know, the first time I, I even mentioned it to my, um, I'm trying to get centered here. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the screen, even though we know that we may not even see the, the visual on this, but um you know, the first time I even mentioned um, 
you know, wanting to do any acting, of course, you know, parents, you know, they all want the best for their kids and everything. It's like, you know, my mom was, my dad was kind of noncommittal, but my mom was just, oh my God, you know, you, you don't want to be an actor. Uh, you know, it's like, I saw this interview with an actor. He said, actors, they they can't pay their bills. They, they sometimes live in their cars and, and, you know, they don't eat every day and, and things like, you know, I guess, you know, she knew me all too well, I guess on the eating part, but, um, <laughs> you know, um, and so, you know, there was, eh, you know, a little bit of pushback from my folks on that. And so, you know, I, that just kind of went on the back burner for me. But years later, uh, after I had been working for the radio station, in fact, I had dropped out of college and I had come back to Corsicana, moved in with my folks, and I'd gone back to work for the radio station. Uh, a very dark, dark period in my life. <laughs> had, there, w- way to go. Um, Display those acting skills. Love it. Uh, yeah, right, right. And uh, so anyway, um, and, and our um, mutual friend, you know, you know Alan Barnes, right? I remember Alan Barnes was the man who taught me how to be a jock. Oh, okay. Okay. So you, he, yeah, you know, Alan, well, he taught you know, me Alan, how to run a break, how to run a board, everything. Yeah. I, I have not seen him in decades, but, uh, I, I hope he's still out there doing good stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know that he's in radio. I'm not, I know he's doing a lot of drumming still. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he's on and off Facebook <laughs> sporadically. Um, but I, I don't know if he's doing anything radio wise. Uh, or acting wise for that matter. But, but anyway, Alan Barnes was the one that really, really kind of got me sort of plugged into the acting thing. Um, it was, as I said, it was kind of a, a period in my life where, you know, I was, I was working at the radio station. I was living at home. I dropped out of school. Nothing was going on in my life really. And I, I, I think Alan saw that and I didn't have, a lot of friends locally that I hung out with and just mostly people I knew at work. And Alan told me he, I had made a costume for a Renaissance festival is, is what it was. And he saw the costume. It was all green. So I wore it for St. Patrick's day or something. And he saw the costume and said, Oh man, you know, you need to be down at the theater helping them out, you know, with, with the children's theater or something. And then he introduced me to, uh, um, Francis, who was running the um, children's theater program at the Warehouse Theater. And uh, th- this happens, that happens, all, you know, the, all, all sorts of things. I started doing crew work for all the regular season shows. And then Alan one day convinced me, he said, man, they're doing I Hate Hamlet. You've got to audition for I Hate Hamlet. Man, you'd be perfect as Andrew. And so I did my first real audition for a real play. And, um, that's, that really, and and I got it obviously. And that really, um, got me hooked. I got me hooked in and that was how I got started with it. Just how I really got going. Now I had a false start back in high school when I was in ninth grade. Uh, I got kicked out of the drama program in ninth grade. (laughs) So, you know, and that's a long story. I won't even go into it, but um, but yeah, that, that's kind of how I got into, got into acting. It was by, it was sort of via radio that I did manage to get into the acting. Well, don't feel bad. I mean, I, I got kicked out of KAND in, in 11th grade. So, and then I almost got kicked out of the army once. So Uh-oh. don't feel bad. That happens to everybody. Yeah. So you had the bug though, right? I had the bug. I already had the bug. What you know, was I mean, the next anytime- step? I'm sorry. Go well, ahead. the next step. Well, let's see. The next step. I, I, I then, of course, I started auditioning for um, a lot of the shows, mostly the plays. I'm, I'm not really that into musicals. I was sort of the odd guy in the in the theater department. I didn't care for musicals that much. I never really have. Uh, it's it's just not my thing. I'm I'm eh, you know I'm just not real musically inclined. I'm I'm not a great singer. Uh, but but I started auditioning for a lot of the plays and getting in those. And uh, I decided that, well, you know, if any, if things don't go well at the radio station and I decide I want to go back to college, I'm going to, um, I'm going to major in theater. I'm going to finish and I'm going to get my degree. And of course, 
you know, never make those kinds of promises because then, you know, you're going to get tested on it because then I found out at some point, not long after I had made that decision and really mentally fully committed to that, um, I found out that the radio station was going to be sold, was, was changing owners. And you and I were in radio long enough to know, both know what happens when radio stations um, change owners. Right. They always come in and they say, oh, this is a winning station or we wouldn't be buying it. We're not going to change a thing. Which lasts for, what, about 30 seconds? <laughs> okay. No, okay, yeah, we kind of locked up there for a oh. second. I didn't, I didn't quite catch everything you said. So I'll just, yeah. So, so the new owners came in, and I'm sure they had that uh, that all staff meeting that they all have, right, where they tell you everything's great, or we wouldn't have bought this place, and we're not going to change a thing, right? Well, you know, it was it was interesting. They didn't really do that, and it turns out that the owners. Um, the new owners came in, they were a cable station Mm. is what they were. They were a cable company and they bought the station because they were looking at getting into radio, getting into broadcasting in in that format. And I think they didn't quite know what to do. They had never really done radio before. And so they, to the best of my knowledge, for the longest time, they kind of left things alone. Uh, I kind of jumped the gun. I went ahead and turned in my notice <laughs> and um, and um, decided, you know what, maybe it's time for me to go back to college. I always said, you know, you, you know this is what I'm going to do if this happens. And so uh, I made the commitment to go back to college and finish my degree, and I got it in theater. So, so anyway, but what I did was I started going to the local college, Navarro College, mm-hmm. uh, full time. It was also about that time I had met, um, I was dating um, my now wife, Catherine. Um, and um, just one thing led to another. Um, I decided I wanted to go up to a school in Fort Worth, and it, she's from Fort Worth, and it just so happened um, that she wanted to move back to Fort Worth herself and take a job or or find some kind of work in her field up there because she wasn't a big fan of Corsicana. And, you know, I mean, I I hate to be sound like I'm ripping on Corsicana or anything, you know, I mean, eh, it is what it is, but please, you you wouldn't be the first and you won't be the last. (laughs) Some, you know, one of the nicknames for our hometown is, uh, the can, which can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, doesn't always have a positive connotation. Yeah, some yeah. I'll, I'll, the first time I ever heard that, I'm like, you know. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, she she wanted to go back to Fort Worth, and I was looking at some schools up in that area, and I settled on Texas Wesleyan University because they had a pretty strong theater department, and uh, that was where it went from there. And she and I moved up to Fort Worth, and uh, while I was in school finishing there, we got married, and. We were married in 95 and uh, yeah, I mean, just lots of, lots of change occurred in that period, that short period of my life. And, uh, you know, so, so that was the next step. I graduated um, from Texas Wesleyan and I was working for a costume shop and this was pre-internet, pre-social media. And so, you know, it was, it's not like it is now um, in my, in my field. And I just didn't know what to do. I didn't quite know what to do. And so I talked to a friend of mine who lived in Los Angeles. Um, He's an older guy. Uh, In fact, he had had been in the television industry since the late 1950s. Uh, He worked as an actor, uh, did a lot of recurring roles and a lot of of co-star type roles, things like that. Uh, He wasn't real super famous or anything. And uh, in fact, he appeared on two episodes, uh, to tell you how far back he goes, he appeared on two episodes of uh, Star Trek, the original series. Well, really? Uh, he, what, what character? Yeah. Well, uh, he, the, the one episode where he was credited um, was 
you, you remember the episode Charlie X? They find the kid on the planet. Yes, and he has these I, crazy powers. And he rolls I hate that episode. But, okay. Yeah, well, he was in that episode. He played the navigator in that one. In fact, oh. he was he's listed in some book I found somewhere. Uh, this particular actor, his name was Don Eitner. Uh, and and the, he was uh, listed as the first actor ever credited with the role navigator in Star Trek. And um, and then he played William Shatner's body double in the the other first season episode. I think it was the first season episode, uh, The Enemy Within. And that was the one where William Shat where Kirk beams it's, in. There's gets, a transporter into- malfunction. And it splits his personalities into two corporal be corporal beings, and and uh, and and you know it's it's there's the good the, the good Kirk and then the evil okay. Kirk. Well, so, so any of the scenes where you saw the two together, yeah, the, the one that you didn't see his face, that was my friend Don. So the the big climactic fight in engineering where where Kirk is basically fighting himself, that that yes. that was your friend and mentor. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my friend and and mentor. Yeah, yeah. As soon as as soon as we get <laughs> off here, I'm jumping onto Paramount Plus and I'm going back to those episodes. Yeah, just take and, a look at it. Yeah, and I, I yeah, hate, he was Kirk. I hate Charlie X. So somebody, yeah, that, I gotta have a good a reason to watch that. Story, but, but yeah, he played the navigator. In it. in fact, he had a line in it. Uh, but he played the navigator in that one. This this would be the pre checkoff right track. You know, before checkoff had been introduced. Uh, so, so anyway, I was talking so to him. So I, I kind of digressed there. I was talking to him on the phone and, and I said, man, what do I do? You know, how do I, how do I get work? He said, well, first of all, you got to go where the work is. And he said, there's not much going on in Texas. And of course, about all we had in Texas at the time was Walker, Texas Ranger. And it was going fairly strong. And I think Wishbone was still in production, if I'm not mistaken. And those are the only two big ones that I can remember. And I think that maybe some of the movie work in Texas was starting to die down a bit. Um, so I, I also, one thing I wanted to do was I wanted to try my hand at makeup artistry. And cause I was, you know, fairly good at that too. And I thought, well, maybe I would get into one of the schools out in LA and, and learn that craft. And he did a little bit of footwork on me, uh, for me, um, on that. And he had some recommendations for me. I, I decided on a school. And so m- my wife and I decided to just move out to California and we did that. We were out there for a year and, oh, a year and some change. And, and then we were so broke. We decided to move back to Texas before we were so broke. We couldn't move. <laughs> So the, and I came back. I went to work for Radio Shack and took a hiatus from acting for about 19 years, which you know I regret. But you know you live and learn. And go go ahead. I was going to say that is when I talk about the process of reinvention. One of the questions I always ask people is, "When do you know it's time? Um, what what was your your good strong sign that told you?" You know what, this shit ain't working. I got to go get a real job. Was it anything specific or what is it just the inability to find work for a year? Well, I mean, it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was a combination of those things. You know, every, every month we're looking at our bank account and we're just getting further and further into the red. And we, we realized that, at that time, you know, maybe, maybe I kind of jumped the gun, you know, mm-hmm. maybe the advice I took was not the best advice. And there's so much I know now, obviously, um, about that, that if I could, you know, if I could get in a time machine, I, of course, I'm sure everybody's thought of this. If I could get in a time machine, go back to 1995, 96, whatever, and give myself this laundry list of things that, okay, do do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it was just mostly the fact that we were just broke all the time and realized, you know, we're, we're going to have to rethink this. Kind of like when I fall in, I fell into the, the, 
the the life of the itinerant radio disc jockey for for quite a while. And I understand. I totally get that. So you came back to yeah. Fort Worth and went to work for Radio Shack. I could tell you some stories. I I had a front row seat for the last days of Radio Shack. It wasn't pretty. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I um Actually, the first thing I did when I got back, I started looking around for work. I actually, I briefly worked for a pet store. And, uh, you know, I love the animals, but I hated the people. <laughs> you know, it was kind of one of those things. And I, I did that for as long as I could stand it. I mean, it was, I mean, I will never forget the smell. I just felt like, I felt like I, I mean, and, and I was showering probably two, three times a day when I was working for the pet store. <laughs> And I just felt like I stunk all the time. I was just, you know, I mean, I guess it just gets in your nose and in your sinuses or something. And you just, you just, and my wife insisted, you don't smell bad. You don't smell. I'm like, I got to take a shower, you know? <laughs> and, um, what, what, so, all, yep. what all animals did you have to work with? Uh, just mostly the, uh, dogs, cats, the dogs, honestly were the smelliest and, and it was the smelliest work, uh, dogs, cats, birds. Um, and you know, we had to maintain the fish and lizards and things like that. I mean, it was, um, so you cleaned up a lot of, of poop. So we did a lot of poop cleaning. Yes. <laughs> and so I, I mean, anyway, I did that, but then they were trying to groom me for a management position with this store. And I was like, uh, this is just not the direction I'm looking that, that I'm wanting to go. And so I quietly at the, the advice of my hairstylist, I, I'd gone to get a haircut and she recommended, I said, yeah, I'm not too happy with the job I'm at. I think I'm gonna start looking around. And she told me, she said, you know, I hear Radio Shack Corporation. This was like headquarters downtown Fort Worth. So not, not so, a yeah, store, you know, not a store, not okay. a store. I, I, I was one of those buttholes in corporate, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, sorry. Can I say that? Can I yes. say that? Uh, um, so, but I, I worked in the creative department. I actually was a very low man on the totem pole there, but, um, and, and I can get to that in a minute, but, um, uh, but anyway, she, uh, she told me, said, yeah, you know, they're hiring at Radio Shack downtown all the time. They said, you should, um, you should go down there and, and see what they've got. You know, I've heard they'll train you. And all that. I'm like, well, okay, well, we'll look into it. And so I did. And uh, I found a, an office clerk position that I, I thought, okay, well, everything they're asking for here looks like it's in my wheelhouse. I can, I can do all these things. And I took the test. I took the test uh, that they give you. And then I, you know, filled out the application, all the other paperwork and, and um, went home. And a couple of days later, <clears throat> excuse me, I get a call from HR at, at Radio Shack. They said, uh, the position that you applied for, actually, we apologize for this. It was filled that day and it shouldn't have even been on the board when you applied for it. Mm. They said, however, we have a similar position in the creative department um, uh, that we, we, you know, if you're interested in it, if you think you're still interested, you know, I can, I can get you an interview with uh, the hiring manager, uh, you need to come and interview with us first. And, and then we can probably get you an interview with, uh, I, was, I was like, um, yeah, sure. Uh, and she was looking at my, um, my resume. And of course I had makeup artistry. I had an art background and uh, I had a background in broadcasting and acting. And so she said, you know, all of these things are things that you could put to good use in this department. I was like, Oh, wow. Okay. So I went in and long story short, I got the job and that's uh, where my career at Radio Shack and ultimately as a production artist began. So um, you would have, you, you would have done a lot of work on their advertising campaigns and such, right? Uh, yeah. Now, not at first. Mm -hmm. uh, I was more or less at, at first I was just an office clerk. I was in charge of making sure the printers worked. Uh, I was just uh, ordering um, props for photo shoots and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I had some connection to that. Uh, ultimately, a few years later, they, they had a hiring freeze going on, but they, they desperately needed layout artists or, or production artists or whatever you want to call them. And 
they asked me, you know, they knew my back, about my background. They asked me, they said, what, what had happened was there'd been a bunch of layoffs about that time. And, um, my job, my role in the department had diminished quite a bit. And I was just really just kind of, you know, just piddling around a lot, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And one day the um, supervisor for the flyer insert team came, walked over, and he kind of leaned on my cube wall. And he said, hey, Steve, how's it going? I'm like, pretty good. I said, I, you don't I, really I, have a whole lot to do around here, do you? And I'm thinking, oh, here it comes. I'm picturing Gary and, Cole from from Office Space. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm, all right, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but anyway, um, so I'm thinking, oh, here it comes. And I, I said, well, I mean, it's yeah, things have slowed down for me. They've kind of reassigned a lot of what I do to other groups, and you know, I'm just basically mostly spray mounting pieces of art to boards and that's about it. And, and then he went on and said, would you be interested in helping us with doing some layout? And I was like, yeah, I, cause I had actually about a year and a half or so before I had approached the then flyer insert manager, um, about doing that sort of thing. And he just pretty much poo-pooed it and just said, nah, nah, nah. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and so I, I was actually looking around for other work at that point uh, because of all the layoffs that were going on. And I thought, well, you know, my number's coming, you know, and, but anyway, this guy, yeah, he, he offered that to me and I said, well, you know, I'm interested in it. Um, he said, you have Quark on your machine? And I said, yeah, I've got it on my machine. In fact, I think I've got all the other Adobe stuff too. And I said, the only thing is I, I don't have access to um, um, any, any tutorials or anything to learn how to use it. And they said, well, have you asked IT? And I said, I asked IT and they told me they didn't have any. He, and he said, well, that's BS. He said, I know for a fact they have it. He said, I, I watched them let an intern use it. And, um, and, and the intern didn't work out, you know, and, and, um, he said, let me go talk to it. And then some it guy comes, you know, sulking in, you know, about an hour and a half later. And he's like, I need to use your computer. And these are tutorials for Quark and, you know, and I was like, oh, okay. I thought y'all didn't have those. You know? <laughs> so suddenly, and, suddenly you go from office space to Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so yeah, and, and then that was how I sort of became a a, a production artist. Um, they called it a layout artist, but it was really just more production artist. It's so, more the standard term in the industry. So tell me, because I, I don't one hundred percent understand the term. What what's the definition of a production artist, or is it kind of one of those loosely defined things where you just do whatever they send you? Well, it's, it's kind of, you know, you've got graphic designers and you got production artists. Graphic designer is really more right brain. Production artist is more left brain. Uh, what I'm doing is basically what I was doing for Radio Shack and then later for another company that I worked for, actually two other companies that I worked for after Radio Shack uh, doing the same thing, similar, similar work. Um, I was basically putting together a puzzle without knowing what the final picture was supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working for the flyer insert team and was putting together flyers, inserts. I even worked a little bit on some of their last catalogs that they did. Um, if you saw any Radio Shack flyers or inserts between the years 2002 and... 2007, maybe even a little bit beyond, uh, I probably had a hand in those. I so. probably, I, and many, many of those would have passed through my hands. Cause if you remember, uh, at the retail policy at the time was that, and, and I actually spent a couple of months working in a radio shack store when I got out of the army in Hawaii, you know, before mm -hmm. I decided to come back in Texas to Texas. And it was like, 
yeah, you know, you want to, you buy a nine volt battery, you got to give them your name and address. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and People anyway, you go in and buy a freaking battery. And, and I think that was probably part of the, the ultimate demise that was probably started the downward spiral, but yeah, a lot of your work would have definitely passed through my hands over those years and probably got me to go in there and buy some doodad I didn't need with money I didn't have. <laughs> so yeah. excellent work. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, and I did that for, I did that from 2002 until 2017, about two jobs later. Um, cause I got laid off from Radio Shack in 2007 and went to work for, um, another company, which I won't mention the name of, um, after that, which it, it was the company Radio Shack outsourced my work to. And so I went to work for them and was basically more or less doing the same thing. And then after I was let go from that company, another layoff, cause Radio Shack, I mean, we were, uh, our particular work group exclusively handled the Radio Shack account. Uh, with this company. And then I went to work for, I, I got laid off from that company because, you know, we all have heard Radio Shack's story and how they, you know, just steadily yeah. declined over the years. And in 2013, I think it was the summer of 2013, I got laid off from that company and um, spent a little time in, in limbo. In fact, it was even suggested a couple of times, actually, after both layoffs, my wife and even my mother-in-law at one point uh, had suggested, well, you know, maybe you should go back into acting. And, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. And, um, so I, you know, I took the one more job. Uh, it was a Tribune um, associated company. Uh, it was uh, basically we, we, we made junk mail is, is what we did. <laughs> Again, and, your, your work is probably past, through my hands and directly into my shredder so. on probably many a day. So. Um, yeah. And so, and probably went straight to the trash, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, and, and I did that. And then in 2017, I got laid off from that company and it was just, I was just like, oh, man, I just like, I, I can't take this anymore. And that was when I kind of had a heart to heart with my wife. And I said, you know, you can say no if you want to, but I really, really feel strongly about going back into acting. What do you think? And she was like, I think it's a great idea. She said, I've been thinking it for years. And I was like, well, okay. And uh, that may have been about the time you and I sort of recap. It, it was because yeah, at that time, so right around 17, I was actually working because, let's see, I'd gone from... Well, after I had my heart surgery, well, I got let go, let, got, had my last radio job in 11, got let go from that, and then had major heart surgery. So I was down for months and months. And then when I got up, I just decided, you know, the whole radio station lifestyle was part of what gave me the heart problems. So, yeah, I can see so that. So I went to work for- <laughs> Having been there, yeah. Went to work for Home Depot for about three and a half mm -hmm. years and just got- fed up with a bunch of shit there and an opportunity came up. I saw this ad. It said star team. Like what, what the hell is star team? Well, it turned, it turned out that the parent company of sprint, my cell phone carrier had come in and bought the remains of radio shack out of their first bankruptcy. Yeah. And I remember that I closed remember. about half the stores, but kept about half of them open and decided we're going to put little mini sprint stores inside of Radio Shack. So it, the right. stars was the sprint team at Radio Shack stars. And so I made contact on that. The recruiter comes back to me who would, who would actually go on to become my boss and makes the pitch to me. We were supposed to do the interview in the Radio Shack store that was still open in my neighborhood. We got there and there was this one crazy psychopath man that ran the store and he had just decided yeah you know what i'm not opening up today don't feel like it so we did oh, the interview man. 
yeah, that and that that was that should have been my first red flag. I should have run running yeah. along. So, <laughs> so we do we do the interview in the McDonald's on the other side of the parking lot, and he says, "Oh yeah, 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 man, you, you've got a great personality. You, these things practically sell themselves. You should, you could make you can make phrase. you can make forty two thousand a year more than anything. You can make forty two thousand your first year. I'm like, holy shit, that would be amazing. And you know what? If I got a, I hated selling shit at Home Depot because I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care about wood. I don't care about no. Now that I've been a homeowner for five years, I, I care about all that stuff now. But at the time I'm like, well, you know what? Smartphones are something I like. I can, I can actually sell that. So yeah, it, it was just crazy because none of the radio shack people, none of the store managers that were still around wanted us there because they, they'd had the, the cell phone business in their store and now, and it was a big, it was big commission, big spiffs for them. And so I, I cycled through three different stores and the last one, I just, uh, it was, it was just bad. I mean, you're, you're, we would be told you're supposed to have a wireless conversation with every customer that comes in. Like, you know, who goes into radio shack in, uh, in, in 2018, you know, who goes into radio shack and, no, no, this would have been 16. Uh, guys who want to dig through the parts bin who are like, you know, they, they come in in their hoodie looking like the Unabomber and you just have to wonder, are they taking those diodes and resistors and transistors back home to their, their, their cabin in the woods? The what layer. are they building? And that's who most of their customers were. Now, we would, <laughs> we would, we would sell some phones. We would get some people in interested in Sprint services, but for the most part, it was just... And you would look at the Radio Shack people, the, the two or three people still working, and they're they're having rubber band wars. <laughs> yeah. Stuff, and they don't have shit left to sell. So, yeah, that was my... You know, that's funny. You know, that's funny. Before I got laid off from Radio Shack um, in the in the creative department, yeah, rubber band wars were big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, those guys with their purchases of rubber bands and other toys, they... I think they kept the uh, the Dollar General store next door open single handedly for most of that time. So there came a day, and and this is where I talk about when you know it's time. And there came a day when I just had had enough, and I was going to walk out. I was going to find some way to explain this to my wife. I'm just like, of course, she knew I'd been very sad. And I transitioned. Then I get a call from another job I'd applied for. And I'm like, oh, cool. So I did that job, which was uh, servicing uh, Mars Wrigley candies in Walmart stores. If you've ever gone in and seen like a great big display of Halloween candy boxes, right? You know, someone right. like me built that, you know, sold that in and built it. And mm-hmm. I didn't really love that job, but it didn't suck. So, yeah. And I, there's some jobs that are like that, man. And I did that until. 18 when I hurt my knee the first time and had to have surgery. And then it, it got, it got, it was made worse because I went back to work too soon and finally wound up leaving that job in May of 19. But when you and I connected, I was doing part-time work for an old business that I'd actually, actually this business, I'm wearing one of the old school shirts, came back sports, ah, which yeah. was a sports broadcasting company I had co-founded. And they hired me to do commercial and promo production and I needed voices. <laughs> mm-hmm. and yeah. That's when you and I had connected on Facebook, like maybe a couple of years before. And right. I'm like, right. yeah, Hey man, I, I, I need some voiceovers and my budget is like, uh, zero. I mean, I, I'm sure I paid you something. I don't remember what I paid you, but I'm sure I paid you something. You, yeah, I mean, you paid me something, but I, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, and it was appreciated. Oh. But yeah, I and and I, and at the time, I was I was wanting to get back into voiceover, and I needed, you know, some vehicles for that, and you know, of course, I, you know, certainly willing to work for free or for you know, for, for peanuts or, or whatever, you know, or for, or for barter and trade, whatever the case may be, um, just to sort of get, um, stuff that I could put on a reel or, or, or whatever that I could put out there and shop myself around, pimp myself around a little bit and, and get some work. 
And so, yeah, yeah, that was, I remember that. You, you know, and mentioning the voiceover industry. So after I became disabled and couldn't go back to my old job, I just decided I'm going to jump back into all this. I didn't want to go back to old school radio because just about yeah. every other job I did, any job I'd ever done or been qualified for had been automated out of existence or remoted right. out of existence. So, and that's when I started doing that stuff. And I found it, I tried to break into the voiceover world and, and I found, and I don't know if this is something you've ever experienced. Uh, you know, I, 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 I go, you know, Hey Google, how do I become a voiceover talent? Next thing you know, you find yourself in somebody's sales funnel. You know, grow your career to the next level. Get coaching with me. Yeah. And did you ever, cause it, it, after a year of very expensive coaching and having agents, basically, I'm sure they were probably laughing in the privacy of their own office, but I, I did get a few creative rejection letters of right. course most of the time in any kind of talent oriented business if they don't want you you never hear back right um when i did finally get an agent i just she just kept sending me the same auditions that were going that were going out to like ten thousand other guys right I'm like right. okay you know there's there's and it's there's, very competitive well it all honestly it wound up being a five-digit mistake for me I invested a lot of money, a lot of time, a right. lot of auditions, and it just went nowhere for me. And that's when that, you know, I talk about reinvention. That's when I decided to pivot the business into live stream production. Right. And and that's worked for me. So I guess my question to you is, and I forgot what the question was. I This is, this. you're the guest and I'm telling my own stories. I tend to fall into that. <laughs> I guess that moment when you just have to decide this shit isn't working and turn to something else. Mm -hmm. have, have you had that experience trying to break back in or did you still have maybe enough people you knew that you were, were able to smooth that rail for you? It's, I mean, it's, it's been a work in progress in trying to get back in. I mean, even to some degree, even still today, I mean, I've got an agent now, uh, I've got, you know, my, my resume has extended, has expanded quite a bit in the last five years, five plus years. <clears throat> and, you know, there are times I feel like, well, you know, I'm just, I, I'm not feeling quite there, uh, you know, and, and. Um, you know, and there are days I get frustrated and I'm, you know, I'm just, just like, you know, why am I doing this? You know, and you know, you know, what am I doing to myself? You know, I'm 57 years old and I'm, you know, still trying to figure out, you know, what I want to be when I grow up. But, you know, I mean, acting is what I want to do. Um, it's just that it's, it is a very... And, and I have to keep telling myself it's, it, it is a very, very competitive business. I mean, I, I do an audition and I know I'm probably up against a hundred guys uh, that look just like me, sound just like me, uh, or, you know, or just some permutation of me. And, you know, I just have to hope I'm the best man and I win, uh, you know, uh, it, and, and sometimes you do. But a lot of times you don't. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, you are. Um, um, I, you know, it's it's just I'm I'm finding that with with this this line of work, uh, it just it does take a lot of persistence, uh, and and just the ability to deal with the hardships that come with it. You know, I've uh, there's a book. Uh, by Jenna Fisher. She's an actress, you know, she played from the Pam office on the office. Yeah. yeah. And it's called an actor's life. And um, she wrote it. That book should be required reading for anyone going into acting. And she talks at one point in the book about, you know, I don't want to give away too much of the book or anything, but she talks about a moment where she broke down crying in the pottery barn. I won't say why, because again, I don't want to, you know, give away too much about her book. Um, but, 
I've had those crying in the pottery barn moments <laughs> myself, you know, and for those who have read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, and, and you will have those moments and it's just a matter of having those moments and then, you know, wiping your eyes and picking yourself up and just say, okay, what do I do next? What do I need to do next? Um, yeah, I, I, again, I, I don't know if I'm really answering your question or not, but. Well, do you ever foresee, and, and, you know, I'm like, I'm not trying to cuss, curse you or anything, but sure, sure. do you ever foresee a time when you might change your mind again, when you might say once again, uh, this shit ain't working. I got to find someone, something else. Or is this, is this, is this something you're, you're dedicating your whole mind, body, and soul to? I think I'm, I'm probably more of the latter mm -hmm. of that one. Uh, I, you know, th this is something, the acting is, is really something that I always wanted to do from a very young age. And you know, I, yeah, I've done a lot of different things, but, you know, I didn't as feel as strongly about those things. You know, I, yeah, I talked about I spent 13 years in radio, but I knew three months in that was not what I wanted to do with my life. Um, with the acting, yeah, when, when I don't get that role I wanted to get and, and I, you know, and, and, and I'm, and I'm wondering how am I going to pay for my kids' college, that sort of thing. Yeah, it breaks my heart. But at the same time, you know, I, you know, this is what I want to do. I, at this point, at this point in my life, at this point in my life, I, I feel like acting is where it's really going to be at for me. And I, I, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm at the point where, you know, they, they say that, well, if you have a plan B, that's a plan to fail. And I, I don't plan to fail at this. It may take a while. I mean, yeah, I'm 57, but you know, there are some people that have made it you know, beyond that age. Right. Um, you know, I don't know. And you know, that's the thing. I know that as an actor being in a non-traditional career like this, no, I will probably never retire. Um, you know, actors, you know, we, we, we tend to work till we drop dead, you know, is, is what, you know, or, or we just mentally, physically can't do it anymore. Um, you know. Well, now to, to ask the cliche question now, what, what advice would you give? Um, maybe not uh, a young person. Okay. Maybe not someone right out of college or right out of high school or anything. Maybe it's someone like you and me, because we're we're both men of a certain age. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm I'm three years younger than you. Yeah, it sounds about yeah, you're the same age as my brother. Yeah. So yeah. what would you tell that man? What would you tell that man who's come to a place in his life where you know he can't stand to do what he was doing anymore or he's been fired three times or anything? What 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 would be your best piece of advice from everything you've learned? Well, let's see. Now, are you talking about like, l let's just reframe this in another way. Are you talking about if I were to be able to speak directly to myself five and a half years ago? Is that what you're saying? Or are you talking about if I could speak to myself when I was 30 or No, five and a half years ago. And, and what I, what I was trying to ask, what would you, anybody, what would you tell, what would you tell me? But I think you've reframed it in, in a, a, a really interesting way. What would you tell your, yourself five and a half years ago? Oh boy. I'll have to think about that. Um, <clears throat> well, I would, um, I guess, you know, all the practical things like, you know, make sure, make sure your debts are settled. You know, I'm talking monetary. Yeah, I, I am talking. You know, economical. No going out and settling uh, scores. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not, not settling scores. Not settling scores. No. Uh, but no, I mean, make sure, make sure you're financially where you need to be. Um, before you, 
set out on a career like this. Um, and, and that would mean, I, I, I honestly, to, to just pull some, an actual thing from my life. Um, I think about the time I became unemployed from my last desk job. That was about the time I think maybe DoorDash and stuff like that had popped up. Um, I resisted that sort of thing because I did delivery jobs when I was, um, and I'm circling back around to something mm -hmm. here, but, um, you know, I did delivery type jobs when I was in college and, and, ah, uh, I mean, it was, I, I, I hated those kinds of jobs. I mean, they were just the biggest, that they were more of a pain in the ass than they were worth to have. Um, and working in food service, things, <laughs> things like that. And, and so I was, and, and my wife kept suggesting, well, you know, why don't you try something like DoorDash? You're like, I'm like, oh, I don't know, man, a delivery, garbage jobs. All that. Yeah. Well, guess what I do now to make ends meet? You know, no, I, seen... I started back in March uh, working for one of the popular food delivery apps. And, uh, well, I, I said it earlier, DoorDash. And, yeah. um, and so uh, I would tell myself to look at, if, if I could, have a direct line to myself five and a half years ago, I would say, look into things like DoorDash, make sure your bills get paid, get all this stuff out of the way because you're going to need all that stuff out of the way. I'm still struggling with, I mean, I'm not ashamed to admit, I'm still struggling with some debt right now from when I was, um, at, that we were carrying at the time I was laid off. And it's been a struggle for us to get, caught up with all of that. And, um, and, and that's been a hindrance and it's something that just sits there and festers in your mind. And, it, and it's a distraction. Eliminate distractions is what it boils down to. Uh, uh -huh. I would tell myself to eliminate as many needless distractions as possible. Um, and you know, that probably would be one of the big things. Uh, just, you know, make sure I'm, I'm financially, I, I would tell myself to make sure I'm financially ready to do this uh, before embarking on it. Now, that's not to say I couldn't go ahead and take acting classes. Um, I should have gotten back into those. I, I looked into it before I actually left my, my last desk job, but I kind of resisted and didn't do it. And I should have done it then, but um yeah. I'd say this is amazing advice. And in fact, it's, it, I kind of think along the same route, I would go back and tell myself that as well, because yeah, it's an interesting parallel between us because I, I actually do, uh, do deliveries for favor now, which mm -hmm. is actually now part of HEB. So it's mostly HEB grocery deliveries. So yeah. I do that a couple of times a week because yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, I guess you can't be afraid to do what's got to be done to keep the bills paid while you chase your passion, right. while you pace your right. dreams or chase your dreams. So let's see, we've been talking for almost an hour now, so I, I won't take up any more of your time, but uh, well, I know you do. I know you do artwork and uh, yeah. also do, do, do you have a website where people can see your artwork? No, not really. I haven't really done anything like that. I think I set up a website years ago. Um, and then I don't know, it was one of those free sites and I think they went okay. out of business and everything just got wiped. And, and it was, it was not something that I was, um, putting a lot of attention on. And, and I'll admit, I don't do as much artwork now, um, as I did years ago. Well, okay. I focus so I wanna... mostly on the acting. So if Steve, when Steven Spielberg wants to hire you, where, where, where can he find you? Where can he find me? Yeah. Uh, well, I am represented by Linda McAllister talent. So, you know, talk to my agent. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I am fully represented and um, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm always looking for something to do. Um, uh, I've got a friend in Dallas that does a lot of, um, um, iPhone filmmaking. In fact, he's become a bit of a, an expert oh, wow. on the subject. That's, uh, and he, that is a subject that extremely interests me. If, really if I can plug his, if I can plug his please, podcast, please do. 
uh, he, he has, or I know it's a YouTube channel and I think he's got a podcast that goes with it and it's called iPhoneographers. iPhoneographers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go to, go to YouTube and, and you can Google iPhoneographers and his name is Blake Calhoun. And uh, I've been in several of his projects. In fact, um, I was in a project he did right, actually right after I got back into acting um, five or so years ago, he did a short film called Miranda that he was entering into a international contest. Um, and it was, I think a certain percentage of the film has to be shot on an iPhone. And I, I can't remember, I mean, he obviously met the, the qualification on that. And um, we actually, the film, that particular film won in its ca- one top place in its category. Where can uh, that be so, seen? Yeah. Where can I watch that? Uh, we were we were pretty proud of that. Uh, actually, I am pretty sure it is on his iPhoneographer's YouTube page. Okay. And again, his name is Blake Calhoun. Uh, it's iPhoneographers. He's he's become a bit of an expert on the subject of iPhone filmmaking, and uh, um, he's not paying me anything to tell you any <laughs> of this. But, but yeah, he's but 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 yeah, he's he's a good friend of mine. I've I've known him for a long time. And uh, you know, we've had professional association. I was in his first feature film, actually, that he did back in 19. He shot oh. it in 1997. Is it the one I'm thinking about? Called Thugs. <laughs> okay. So before I let you go, you got to talk about Thugs. Tell, oh, okay. Sure. Tell, yeah, I'd love talk to. about Thugs. Yeah. Tell, me some, tell me the story behind that. <clears throat> well, how, how it was born, how Thugs was born was that, it, it began life as a short film, like some films do. Um, you know, Napoleon Dynamite started as a short film. Right. Actually, you know, a lot of people, I think some people, I, I don't know if a lot of people don't know it, but, you know. But but anyway, Thugs started as a short film. It was called Excess. And it was about these these two mobsters that were going to this guy's house. He lived out in this suburban area. And um, we, it was shot in Arlington. And um, I was in it, uh, an actor named Rald Martinson was in it, uh, and, and he and I were the thugs. And then uh, another guy, I'm trying to remember his name. I feel bad I don't recall his name. I haven't seen him in a long, long time. But uh, he played a guy named, uh, in, in, now in Thugs, he was called Rance. But in the short film, I don't know what his name was. They changed the names from the short film to the, the feature length. But anyway, the film was called excess. We show up at this guy's house and we lean on him for some money because he owes us a bunch of money for gambling debts. And anyway, that, that was done. It was just a a short film project that Blake was doing. And he told me that, Hey, I've done a feature length version of this. I took this scene and I decided to build a a feature length movie around it. And um, he said, would you be you know, interested in reprising your role? He said, I'm probably changing the names of the characters. And I was like, yeah, sure. Now, I had moved out to California at that point. And I said, but, you know, I'm, I'm in L.A. now. And he said, that's OK. He said, I'll, I'll fly you back in for that because they, they shot it in the Dallas, Arlington, maybe a little bit in Fort Worth um, area. And. And and then he said, oh, yeah, and by the way, uh, he said, it's no big deal to fly you out. He said, actually, uh, Rald is is interested in, in doing this, too, and he also lives in L.A. He had, he had moved out there unbeknownst to me. And I was like, oh, I had no idea he was living out there. I said, yeah, he moved out there about six months before you did. And then when I um, I got my script, he, so, he, so Blake mailed me a script, and um, – he said, oh, and you should try to get together with Rald and uh, you guys can run your scenes because we had tons of scenes together. And I was like, yeah, that would be a really good idea, especially since he lives here now. I said, do you have his phone number? I can give him a call. And he said, yeah, sure. And he gave me his number. And so I, I called up Rald. And it turns out Rald literally lived. I was living in North Hollywood at the time. And Rald lived just down in Toluca Lake, which was literally about maybe five or six city blocks from where I lived. 
I, I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I mean, we were just almost right practically in the same area. And uh, so, yeah, we got together and we, uh, we, we, you know, ran our lines and stuff. And then we, we shot the film in, <clears throat> let's see, we shot the film in August and September of 97. In fact, I think on the final, the not to be all dark or heavy or anything, but the final day of shooting, actually, we uh, that was the day that Princess Diana um, hmm. passed away in her car accident. So you know, kind of that dark shadow there over that. But uh, and and it's that's why I can remember the time period on all that. And uh, so yeah, I was I was back here in the Dallas Fort Worth area for about three weeks while we were doing that. And, uh, yeah, it, um, trying to think of any funny stories from it. I, I mean, it was just a pretty standard film shoot. You know, it was, it was uh, just a straight up indie, indie thing. You know, we all ate, you know, the craft services, um, consisted of, you know, Totino's frozen pizzas and little handy snack cracker snack things. And, so were you, were you guys, uh, were you guys like uh low budget Vincent and Jules, you know, for like from Pulp Fiction? Is that, is that kind of what it was? He was, um, I mean, Blake is a big fan of Quentin Tarantino and he loves that bantery type stuff. And so, yeah, it was, it was a lot. And it, it, in fact, there was even one review that I, I saw on it where they referred to it as darkly Tarantino-esque or something <laughs> like that. I, you know, <laughs> but it, it was kind of similar to that. I mean, yeah, Qu- yeah, Quentin Tarantino was really big at the time. Pulp Fiction was still being very much talked about as a movie. And so, yeah, I mean, it was kind of in that vein. It was very similar. And yeah, I, I, I hate to give away any of the, the storyline on it, but it was, it was basically the movie was about essentially one of the characters wanted to get out of the mob Uh and it just, and it wasn't my character, but it, and it just turned into a big, huge mess. And literally nearly everybody except the guy that wanted to get out of the mob ends up dying before the, (laughs) before the, you know, the film's over, you know, and, and, and I say I hate to you know spoil the movie or anything, uh, but I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day. It, it, I think he sold it to um, some distribution company. Supposedly, it's been seen on German television. No, I was going to ask you that. Okay, I, okay I, yeah, I think supposedly. I remember you posting something about that on uh, on Facebook one day. That it yeah. had made like some kind of top ten list in Germany. Well, I I don't know if it made any top 10 lists in Germany. Now, I do know for a fact, I can say this, it has been seen on a television in Germany. And the only reason I know that is because I have a cousin who lives in Germany. She found the movie Thugs on the German Amazon and she bought it And because (laughs) I was in it. And she sent me a clip of it, you know. And, and, and unfortunately, I can't say, hey, roll the clip, you know, but, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, she sent me um, a clip of it. And of course, it was um, overdubbed in German. I was amazed at how well they matched my voice and, and Rawls' voice in the scene that we watched. Um, and, and I was talking to someone who said, yeah, when they in German, when, when they overdub German movie, American movies in German like that, they tend to pay attention to the voice styles and everything. And they try to match it to the original actor. Uh, so, I mean, it sounded like me speaking German, you know I mean? But it was kind of weird to watch, but, um, but, but yeah, so I know it's been seen on a TV in Germany. Uh, but as far as the story as to whether it actually aired on German and television, German television in Germany. Um, I, you know, I can't independently verify that. You know, it's crazy. When I was a when I was a kid, my dad was stationed over there in the army, or we were in the Netherlands, and what we got German TV over the air. And you know, I'm eight years old, a huge Star Trek fan, and then I turn it on, and it's like, oh, there's Star Trek. Wait a minute, what, Mister Mister Spock speaking German? What yeah. The, what the hell? 
that, that just completely freaked me well, out. But, you know. Yeah, and it's it's it always comes back to Star Trek for me. I always some I always bring it back to Star Trek. But oh, I love Star Trek. You know, man, I would I would love to get get a, get work on one of the current properties that's out there right now. But you know, would just be uh like uh you know engineering crewman number three on Strange New Worlds or Discovery. Yeah, something like that. No, no, uh, no. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I'm sure you could aspire yeah. to. I'm sure you could do much better than that, but personally, yeah, I mean, that... I, I, yeah, I mean, with, with all the Star Wars and Star Trek stuff that's you know that that's out there right now, I mean, I I, I live in hope that you know, hey, maybe you know, I'll get on one of those or something, but but until then, you know, <laughs> be a petty criminal cut in half by Obi Wan Kenobi. If if yeah, exactly. I had that, yeah. that would be the top of my resume. That would be my life's crowning achievement, right? Yeah, there. man who loses hand, you know, <laughs> and by lightsaber, you know. Didn't you do some? Four. Didn't you do some animated or anime? Some anime voiceover work, or am I thinking of someone else? Um, very briefly, I I had a contract. Uh, you have you heard of the company Funimation? Funimation? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I had I had early when I got back into to voiceover, I had um gotten a contract with Funimation. Uh, this was before I was represented. And of course, for those who don't know, Funimation is one of those companies that they do English dubs of Japanese and Korean, and I think even some Chinese um, anime. And um, I had um, submitted a voice demo to them that I had done. In fact, I went to the KAND studios and recorded some of that demo. <laughs> I, I I contacted the, the program director there and I said, "Hey, do you mind if I, you know, Bob, you mind if I, uh, you know, come in and you know record some stuff?" Oh, yeah, sure, you know. So, um, uh, but anyway, I did a, I submitted a demo to them, and of course, you know, there are everybody and their dog, you know, wants to to do voiceover for Funimation. And I um, reached out to their talent coordinator and submitted a, a demo. And I got, you know, kind of a form email, what seemed like a form email back saying, well, thank you for your submission. Um, we have a waiting list of over 500 demo tapes. You know, if when we get around to it, if we like what we hear, we'll give you a call. You know, And so I... I didn't expect to hear anything for, you know, months, if ever. Uh, well, then about a month later, the talent coordinator reached out to me and said, yeah, we, we listened to your demo. We liked it. Uh, would you be interested in auditioning for us? And I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, so I came in and I auditioned uh, for one of their directors. And then a couple of weeks later, I came in and I, I can't remember the name of the show uh, that I was doing, but we were just basically in a crowd. This was pre COVID by the way. And we're crowded around a microphone in a tiny whisper booth, you know, making um, animal noises around a mic. And I mean, that was, and then I think they gave me a few lines kind of what would be the anime equivalent of an extra uh, I think I had to say something like, please take your seat. We'll be landing in five minutes or, you know, and, and then I had to do, and you know how, when you watch anime, a lot of times you'll see these close up um, facial things of a character and they're making noises like, <laughs> you know, like that. I, I had to do some of those, uh, you know, it's such a glamorous life, you know, and um, uh, did that. And I had a lot of fun and, and I made $70 that day. I'm like, all right, here we go. And a couple of weeks later, they contacted me again and said, yeah, we'd like you to come back in. We'd like you to, to, to do some more recording for us. Well, damn it all. I got the flu oh. right before I was supposed to do this. My voice was wrecked and, um, I had to call them and it was, you know, I went to the doctor and they, yeah, you got the flu and I had to go on the, whatever they call that stuff uh, that you take for it and Tamiflu. Yeah. I had to go on the Tamiflu and everything. And I, I contacted them and, and I said, yeah, I 
have got the flu. I don't think it's a good idea for me to come in. And they respond to that. Yeah, well, thank you for letting us know. And I'll pass that along to the director. And I never heard from them again after wow. that. But, but uh, it was only a couple of weeks after that, uh, I did get a response back from an agent that I had submitted my demo to. And uh, I did have an interview with them. And then, boom, I was uh, represented for voice work. And it's, it's the agency I'm with now. And then a little later, uh, I, I got across the board representation about a year, year and a half after that. So, well, that's awesome. So I'll keep looking out for you. I'm sure you're going to, you, you, a guy like, guy like you is going to have nothing but success. I'm sure. I mean, that's what we're hoping on <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any parting words? Not appreciate it. No, seriously, we'll be looking for you and uh, keep keep uh, keep hanging on, keep the faith, keep doing what you got to do, mm-hmm. and uh, just you know stay on social media and let us know when the big break yeah. comes. Yeah, and I've I've got a um, couple of projects that I have worked on that have not released yet. Um, one I think I can talk a little about. Um, it's um, it's called Stellular. And it is a, I, I'm, I, I think I, I have the, the production's blessing to talk about this. Uh, don't, um, don't get me sued out of existence, dude. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure it's fine. I, this, this guy appreciates the, the, the publicity and, and everything, but okay. it's called Stellular and it's a, it's kind of a science fiction kids show. It's a little bit faith-based and, and um, um, I, I play a really interesting character. In, in that one, it was a pilot for a series and uh, it's, it's being actively pitched. And so, you know, we're hoping, you know, something, something comes of that. Uh, I've got another uh, a film that I was in. I'm, I'm a little hesitant to, to say anything about it because, you know, I don't want to accidentally, um, you know, violate any NDAs I might've possibly signed when I, when I was filling out paperwork for that. Uh, but I'll certainly, when I can, um, when, when I know for sure that I can say anything about it, um, uh, I will definitely be putting the publicity out there about it. All right. Well, but let's say I, I will just say about it in that particular one, I play an iconic figure in American literature. Ooh. Well, we'll definitely be looking forward to that. That's all I'll say. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, Stephen Elkins, actor, artist, half a dozen other things. Half Thank you for taking the things, yeah. thanks for taking the time. We'll talk again soon. Yeah, I'd, I'd you know I'd be willing to do this again sometime, man. This is a lot of fun. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Yeah. Okay, so I've. You're welcome.